another one other one other case I sort of want to give here is that of former Congressman Mark Siljander. This was just in the news uh, the other day, Washington Post on Thursday. Not getting the traction I wish it would. It's the headline this group has feared all along. It's based on chapter three of this book. Washington Post went and investigated. Uh, organizer of National Prayer Breakfast, the other guys who run the National Prayer Breakfast, organizer of National Prayer Breakfast uh, accepts terrorist funds. Um, that doesn't look good. Um, and the way that happened is the former Congressman Mark Siljander from Michigan became a leader of the group, not just a political leader, but a theological leader. He was a big thinker. He came up with the idea that he calls Messianic Muslims. Heard of Jews for Jesus? <laughs> Messianic Muslims. It's got to have alliteration. It's got to have a little zip to it. Messianic Muslims. So he travels around the world with the family. Uh, he's a lobbyist. Travels around the world with the family. And his special friend, unlike Abacha, he's got a lot of special friends. My favorite is Omar al-Bashir. Omar al-Bashir is now, right now, uh, in charge of the Sudan. He's the first sitting head of state to be indicted for genocide uh, because of Darfur. You may have heard of Darfur. Well, Siljander went over and prayed to Jesus, said, Bashir just melted his heart, came back, got on Christian Right TV and said, Bashir, you know, he loves Jesus. He really does. Um, and uh, we got we to stand by him. We can't put sanctions on him. Uh, we got to do business with him. We've got to love him through business. Um, bad news is, right now, no sanctions on, uh, no sanctions on Sudan. Um, but sanctions on Siljander, who, uh, because of that headline I mentioned, was pled guilty this July to laundering money through this organization is now facing 15 years in prison. So there's a happy ending. Inhofe is still at large. Um, Inhofe, explaining how he does this, cites Acts 9.15. This man is my chosen instrument to take my name before the Gentiles and their kings. They underline kings. Radical misreading of that passage. This is repeated in a document called the Eight Core Aspects, distributed this year at the National Prayer Breakfast. I asked the leader of the group, the author of that document, why the kings they sought out, the kings they cultivate, the leaders they support instead of regular people are so often corrupt. He seemed puzzled. He didn't acknowledge, he didn't just deny that they were. But sure they are, the bad guys. He says, because that's what's there. That's what's there. As if the fact of power is its own justification. At C Street, and maybe here in Salt Lake City, we've reached a point where piety and corruption are not at odds, they're one and the same. But what most of us see as corruption, they experience as piety. As awful as this is, as many here as have been hurt or cast aside, I want to close with one more example, because this is not something that happened, this is something that's happening right now. I want to take us overseas just one more time to trace the long shadow of American fundamentalism. Because the ideas that we fight over here, maybe in our personal lives, maybe in the public square, those ideas echo around the world. The American fundamentalism, whether it's that of evangelicalism or the authority that you all struggle with, uh, has far greater consequences overseas. And this, I want to close with this because we all pay lip service to this idea of never again, after the Holocaust, never again. In Uganda right now, we have an opportunity to act on that. In Uganda, the idea of genocide has been set on simmer. It's not something that happens. This is something that's happening. Uh, last October, a member of the parliament named David Bahati, who received his political training in Washington, he was one of the young guys. That wasn't, I didn't, wasn't there when I was there. He was that same thing. He studied with these guys before he went back to Uganda to run for parliament. He'd been the beneficiary of, of uh, in-house counseling. John Ashcroft had come over, gone over to Uganda to mentor him. The family had poured millions of dollars into what they called leadership development, taking Uganda, this now, by the way, newly oil-rich nation, uh, and trying to turn it into a country that could have a leadership led by God, where the separation of church and state, when Inhofe called the phone, this idea that never was, would not apply. That in Uganda, they could achieve what they cannot achieve here, that they could go out to the margins and with the weight of American power, uh, do things that they can't do there. Bahati, love this idea, this, this David Bahati. Um, and he came up with a bill to put it into action. Uh, it's called the Anti-Homosexuality Bill. And um, you've, got a, you've got a thug here. Uh, Packer? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bahati, Bahati thinks Packer the right way. Bahati's bill is death penalty for homosexuality. Now, he's a forgiving man. Only one time, only one gay ass life in prison. 
If you're a serial offender, death. Promotions, talking about it, what I'm doing here, and by the way, what you're doing here by listening, seven years in prison. If you know a gay person, if you're heterosexual and you know a gay person, and you fail to report them within 24 hours of becoming aware of that fact, whether or not they're your relative, three years in prison. It's by far and away the most draconian anti-gay bill in the world, and it's not just for Uganda. Working with, uh, he is the leader of something that you might call the C Street of Uganda. They, they establish groups of politicians just like they have here in the Ugandan parliament. Working with his brothers in Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, he aims to purge Africa of homosexuality. Now, the Americans, even Inhofe, after Inhofe stayed quiet about this for a while, finally said, yeah, that's not what I meant. That goes a little too far. Um, uh, Tom Coburn, the same thing. All the Americans eventually got around. Uh, actually, that's not true. Sam Brownback, Senator Sam Brownback, so you can't, you can't condemn that. Um, but uh, uh, most of them ended up saying that's not a nice idea. They did not go as far as Senator Russ Feingold who said, hey, why don't we stop giving guns to this country that's preparing to kill gay people? Now, let's not be extreme. So, but they say, we didn't mean for the killing to happen. There's even someone in the organization who are genuinely opposed. They're doing what they can. And, and you know, I applaud them. But the real response has been to say, you know, we didn't pull the trigger in Uganda. We didn't kill anybody. And that's true. They built a gun, and they put it on the table. And now David Bahati, their brother, is preparing to lift it. So it's hard to imagine what's at stake with this. Instead, it's still in the abstract. I want to close with a very short passage. Um, I spent a lot of time in Uganda. I spent a lot of time with David Bahati. Um, who, you know, when someone, he, he called me up. He wanted to talk to me. When someone's planning genocide, he invites you to lunch. You go. <laughs> Next week, we come lunch. Um, but he me. We spent a lot of time together. He still calls, you know, my genocidal pal. Um, uh, uh, um, but I want to just close with a little passage of what's at stake for I'm, I'm maybe the other side of things. This is the story of a, of a, a, a person named Victor Mikasa. Uh, Victor Mikasa, a trans man, born female, living male, interested in girls. As a child, Juliet Mikasa, she was born, knew she was attracted to children of the same sex. She had been raised Catholic, but enjoyed an American-style Pentecostal church, hoping that in the music and the dancing and the Holy Ghost, the ecstasy, she would find the resolution of her desire. She did not want to be gay. But Juliet Mikasa was not, at, not skilled at leading two lives. She dressed as Victor. She could not think to dress like a girl. A pastor determined that she was possessed by a male spirit and asked his flock to help him heal her. The exorcism took place at the altar in front of a thousand Christians, boys and men from the church's healing ministry laying on hands and speaking in tongues as the women in the pews swayed and sang for Mikasa's liberation as the pastor called it, her freedom. They took her arms gently and then firmly, and then they held her and stripped her, slowly, garment by garment, praying over each piece of demonically infused cloth. She had bound her breasts. They bared them. I cried, and every time I cried, they would call it liberation. They slapped her, but it was holy slapping, they said, and when she stood before them completely naked, the men's hands roaming over her body and then inside, they said that was holy too. Then they locked her in a room and raped her for a week. This is known as a corrective, a medical procedure, a cure. When it was all over, the pastor declared that the church had freed Mikasa, and maybe in a sense it had. Victor Mikasa no longer believed there was a demon inside him. The demons were in that church. Mikasa became a man and an activist, determined to prevent what had happened to him from happening again. In 2003, he co-founded the LGBT rights group Freedom in Rome, Uganda. In 2005, Ugandan police, led by government officials, raided his house. They didn't find Mikasa, but a friend, Yvonne, was there. They took her down to the station. They stripped her. You look like a man, they said. We're going to prove you are a woman. It happened again. Mikasa fled. But in hiding and then in exile, he planned. The plan was not lesbian, it wasn't gay, it was human. It was a citizen's plan. Mikasa sued and never was a lawsuit, more like a gift of the spirit, the romance of the rule of law. The reason I close with that story is it's one of the few that has a happy ending. Mikasa won. Here's a country that is on the brink of genocide, possibly. 
But until then, there are laws, and you can't kick down doors without a search warrant. So due process won the day. But not due process. What won the day was Mikasa's boldness. Mikasa remained, by the way, a very devout Christian. Mikasa's boldness in speaking out and saying, this is not, this is not democracy, this is not Christianity. So Mikasa, Mikasa brought to the public square in Uganda, I should say that case is a case that um, um, has a lot of, has connections not even all that far from here. Uh, the leader of the anti-gay movement there receives half his income from a Las Vegas megachurch called Canyon Ridge. Um, he also receives federal dollars, by the way, to fight AIDS. That's one way to fight it. Uh, uh, but Mikasa responded uh, by, by walking into the public square and doing something that I think you all here are doing, and is, is really the response to this kind of authoritarianism. Um, uh, one of the worst presidents in American history, James Buchanan, not well remembered, uh, governed up to 1861, you can see where maybe he kind of went wrong, uh, didn't, didn't hold things together very well. He had one, one great observation at a time when a lot of people in American public life were calling for uh, a bipartisanship at any cost, even erasing the real differences, even saying, hey, no, we must stand for, for what we believe in, we must argue, we must debate, we must have ideas. People were saying, no, 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 let's have harmony, let's all be one. James Buchanan said, I like the noise of democracy, the noise of democracy. Democracy is noisy. Democracy is not harmony. Democracy is cacophony. Democracy is one person thinks this, another person that. Democracy is you're sitting in maybe in a, a, a church pew or, or a temple and uh, uh, you're singing next to somebody. I, as a religion reporter, travel all the time and see the churches and people have to sit next to me and listen to me sing. It's terrible. But that's cacophony. That's the noise of us making noise of it together. The noise of democracy. What I heard here last night was to me the noise of democracy and just about moved me to tears. There was one speaker last night who described it I thought was beautifully. He said, decent, common, and human. And I just I went to bed last night thinking about that. Decent, common, and human. Decent, common, available to all of us, and human. Not because that's what's there, as the leader of the family says, in justifying uh, their, their cultivation of corruption. Not because that's what's there, as I suppose the Mormon church may be saying to you, to just sort of accept power as it is. Not because human, not because that's what's there, because it's what's here within each of us. We have the noise of democracy within us.